On 5 News, a big rise in council tax. Households in England could see bills go up 6% over two years to help pay for social care. Also on the programme, ceasefire. What ceasefire? More fighting in Aleppo as planned evacuations are postponed. Victims of the thalidomide scandal call for new compensation. And the boy who made a football top out of a plastic bag finally gets to meet his hero, Lionel Messi. Hello, welcome to Five News. I'm Matt Barbett. Families across England are set for a 6% rise in council tax to help tackle the crisis in social care. That's the figure the government is expected to announce tomorrow, putting up bills by an average of nearly £100 over the next two years. Critics say it is only a short-term solution. While at Prime Minister's Question Time today, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn clashed over what should be done. Our political editor, Andy Bell, has more. What's Amanda? Paying for all the services classed as social care has been a problem looming for years. Now, Five News understands tomorrow the government will announce local councils will be able to raise more money more quickly through the council tax to help them cope. The average band D council tax in England is £1,530. Councils have been allowed to put what's called a precept of 2% on that to fund social care. The government will announce that could be 3% next year and the year after, but the total over the next three years must be no more than 6%. That could add £91.80 to that council tax bill. At the last Prime Minister's questions of the year, the Labour leader chose social care for his line of attack. This social care crisis forces people to give up work, to care for loved ones because there isn't a system to do it, makes people stay in hospital longer than they should and leads people into a horrible, isolated life when they should be cared for by all of us through a properly funded social care system. Get a grip and fund it properly, please. Theresa May answered by saying Labour had never tackled this when they were in government. In 1997, they said they'd sought it in their manifesto. They issued, had a royal commission in 1999, a green paper in 2005, the One List report in 2006. In 2007, in the CSR, they said they'd sought it. In 2009, they had another green paper. 13 years and no action whatsoever. Those looking at this problem say the new plan is not going to be enough for local councils. They have used the 2% uh, council tax rise to raise around £400 million, but we know that the scale of the problem, we're talking about a £2.6 billion black hole in social care budgets, so this rise is really not going to make that difference. We need something more long-term, more sustainable and national solution to this problem. But the big challenge remains how to piece together that long-term solution. Let's have a word with Andy Westminster now. And Andy, increasing council tax is unlikely to be popular. Does the government now have a long-term plan for paying for social care? No, frankly, I don't think they do. And if you talk to people in government, they admit that what they're going to announce tomorrow is not anything like a long-term plan. It, to their critics also, uh, the critics say it's not even a short-term stopgap solution. Basically, on the face of it, it looks as if whoever is in government is going to have to raise an awful lot of money somehow to pay for social care. Now, to get that sort of plan bedded in for the long term, you're going to have to the, have the agreement of probably, certainly the Labour opposition, maybe most parties across the House of Commons on that long-term plan and as you saw from what happened at Prime Minister's questions today there is precious little agreement at the moment as to how to carry that forward but you know this is a work in progress one more point that the uh, Prime Minister was keen to make today she said there was also a difference between the way that different councils manage this problem so she was keen to say it's not just a matter of money it's also about how you manage it well I think a lot of local councils around the country will be saying it's all very well for her to say that for us it does come down to money Andy thanks very much indeed it was just when the people of eastern Aleppo thought there was a glimmer of hope, a ceasefire that was meant to let them escape has now collapsed. Buses have been sent in to help evacuate the besieged city, while government forces promised to stop bombing the area. This morning, though, the buses left without anyone on board and the airstrikes began again. Our chief correspondent, Tessa Chapman, has the latest. It doesn't look like a ceasefire or sound like one. This is East Aleppo, where rebels and civilians, tens of thousands of them, are hemmed into one square mile. 
Inside that ruined neighbourhood, activists said pro-Assad forces were breaking the peace deal. We spoke to the man who recorded this. Uh, this uh, morning, uh, the shelling uh, and uh, bombardment uh, are uh, back. I, I feel uh, maybe uh, I die uh, uh, anytime. Maybe after uh, five minutes, uh, uh, bomb, uh, bombing in my building, and uh, I uh, lose my soul. Salah had hoped to leave at dawn today on one of the government buses waiting to take civilians and fighters out to the rebel-held countryside. By lunchtime, they were heading back to the depot. The deal undone for now, the government and rebels blamed each other. Where opposition fighters have been pushed out, there is chaos too. Here, a search for food and supplies in a building abandoned by a militant group. We didn't even have a piece of bread. People died of hunger, this man said. There are many different rebel groups, some supported by locals, others not. It's always important in politics to read between the lines. In an interview with Russian state TV, President Assad stood firm, accusing Western countries of trying to save terrorists by pressing for a ceasefire. So the fighting goes on, more people get hurt and there are just five doctors left to treat them. The White Helmet Rescue Squad, seen here last month, can't work anymore. We heard a lot of dead bodies on the streets between the front lines and the front lines. We couldn't reach them. White Helmet, civilians, FSA and everyone in Arab City, all of us want to leave Arab City. All what we need now, just safe route to the countryside for Arab City. Western countries say it's down to Assad's ally Russia to act. But time is running out in this most desperate place. Tessa Chapman, Five News. Here, the minister in charge of Brexit has suggested the UK could remain in the single market after leaving the European Union. David Davis told a committee of MPs the government hadn't yet made its final decision. EU leaders have said that staying in the single market would mean the UK accepting freedom of movement. Former football coach Barry Bunnell has been remanded in custody after appearing in court charged with sex offences. The 62-year-old appeared via video link at South Cheshire Magistrates Court this morning. He is charged with eight counts, including five of indecent assault against a young boy. And the UK's mobile phone network has been branded appalling by a new study. It ranks us 54th in the world for 4G connections. That's behind the likes of Albania and Peru. And it's called on operators and the government to ensure that Britain is a world leader when the superfast 5G connection is introduced. It was a medicine originally given to pregnant women to help with morning sickness, but it led to many of their babies being born with devastating defects. Thalidomide affected tens of thousands of children born in the late 1950s and early 1960s. And now European politicians are set to call on the government in Germany where the drug was made to pay compensation to survivors. Our health correspondent Catherine Jones has been to meet one of them. Mikey copes with the consequences of the thalidomide scandal every day. Now she's 54 years old, the deformities she was born with are increasingly restricting what she can do. I can still pick things up with my feet, but I'm suddenly finding that I'm not quite being able to, to get them to my hands anymore. It's just massive deterioration, and through deterioration is loss of independence. Mikey was born like this because her pregnant mother had taken pills promoted as a miracle cure for morning sickness. Between 1958 and 1962, tens of thousands of women had babies with severe birth defects, until the German firm which made the drug, Grunenthal, finally withdrew it from sale. It took until 1972 for families to receive some compensation in an out-of-court settlement, but since then it's emerged the German government of the time helped protect Grunenthal from court cases that would have secured more money for British victims. So tomorrow the European Parliament will pass a resolution calling on today's German government to pay out more. The Germans, being good Europeans, often tell the other European countries when they break the values of the European Union this time it's the German government who are breaking the values and I think they'll have no choice but to react to this resolution. It will make a huge difference to the Flidomiders' lives. Um, they do not have enough yet to meet all their health needs and every extra bit of resource 
will help them in the last third of their lives to live with dignity and respect. The German government doesn't have to comply, but Mikey says yes, if that happens, she still won't give up. It's one that burns quietly away inside. It's like nothing anybody will do now will ever give us back our, our limbs and take away the lives that we've had with disability, with struggle. Get the message. You know, you guys created the scenario that I don't have the financial assistance that I need. I don't want to keep fighting for it, but oh my God, I will. Would you mind getting my hair out the back? Those oh, affected right, by thalidomide have already fought for justice for more than 50 years and will continue to hold those responsible to account. Catherine Jones, 5 News. Coming up on 5 News. Warnings that schools could suffer from a £3 billion funding crisis. And a meeting with Messi for the little boy who honoured his idol with a plastic bag shirt. More of him coming up after the break. Welcome back, you're watching Five News. England's state schools have been warned they'll have to make savings of £3 billion by 2020. The spending watchdog says purse strings have to be tightened, even though the majority of secondaries already have a budget deficit. The government says it is changing the way the money that is there is shared to make the system fairer, though. Peter Lane reports. And then, in a twinkling, I heard on the roof... Term ends with the Christmas production at Silver Hill Primary in Derby, one of the areas feeling the brunt of an imbalance in school funding. They get just over £3,000 per pupil here. Some schools in other areas get more than £5,000. Budgeting for the building, staff and curriculum is tough enough, they say, without that inequality. And that is, is very frustrating because everything is not on a level playing field. However, there's no point whinging and moaning about it. You actually get on and you do the very best you can with the money that you have available to you. If more money was available to us, that would have a huge impact. Today, the government pledged new number crunching based on pupils' needs, not postcodes. Our school funding system, as it exists today, is unfair it's opaque and it's outdated. The proposals for funding reform will mean that all schools and local areas will now receive a consistent and a fair share of the school's budget. But the public spending watchdog says the overall budget pot isn't keeping pace with rising costs, meaning state schools in England will have to find £3 billion in savings by 2020, equal to an 8% budget cut. Under the new proposed formula, 10,000 schools will gain, but a similar number will lose. But a significant proportion of the savings are also expected to come from how schools use their workforce. And clearly that's absolutely crucial to get that right so that the educational outcome for children are not affected. With disagreement on how much money is needed and how it should be spread, no school is about to get a Christmas funding present. The proposed changes will be consulted on in the new year. Peter Lane, 5 News. Now, talks aimed at ending southern rail strikes have finished for the day without an agreement being reached. Passengers have been warned to expect severe disruption tomorrow, even though staff aren't striking. They will walk, again, walk out again though on Friday as part of their ongoing row over the role of guards. Cabin crew at British Airways have also voted for industrial action in their dispute about pay. They rejected a 2% pay rise, and although no dates have been set yet, their union hasn't ruled out holding strikes over Christmas. And millions of energy customers are still paying hundreds of pounds more than they need to because they haven't switched to cheaper tariffs. New figures have been published by the regulator Ofgem to show how much people could save if they shopped around. Now, yesterday we reported on the surge in hate crimes in America since the start of the presidential campaign there. It is an extreme example of how attitudes towards minorities, especially Muslims and immigrants, have hardened. Across the US, many people voted for Donald Trump because of what they saw as his nationalistic agenda. But how much does that encourage those on the far right, or so-called outright, to speak out? Julian Duker has been to Indianapolis to meet Matthew Heimbach, the chairman of a group many have labelled fascist. 
He's also banned from coming here to the UK. A warning, you might find some of his views offensive. Don't worry, we're going to build that wall. That wall will go up. A total and complete shutdown of Muslims entering the United States. Donald Trump raised the temperature with the kind of rhetoric seldom seen in an election campaign. But was it red meat for those on the far-right fringes of American politics? Hail Trump! Hail our people! Hail victory! Cheers, applause and Nazi salutes. The so-called alt-right movement of neo-Nazis and white supremacists has been emboldened by the rise of Donald Trump, though he has condemned them. Among its most prominent exponents is Matthew Heinbach. And this is our symbol and our flag. Amen! I don't think that Donald Trump's election has led to the rise of the alt-right. I think the rise of the alt-right led to Donald Trump's election. We traveled to Indianapolis to meet him and members of the party he chairs. It has only a few hundred members, but he is now one of the poster boys of the wider, growing, mostly online phenomenon. He was banned from entering the UK for views like these. There already are homelands for people of the, you know, the Muslim faith and of Arab heritage. So I would encourage them to be able to go home to their own nations where we can work in peace and prosperity. Hundreds of his supporters laud him as charismatic. But are these just old fashioned, ugly, neo-Nazi views with a new face? What do you say to those people who say your views are repugnant, and completely disgusting. These ideas we've shown with the election of Donald Trump, with the election when it comes to Brexit, when it comes to the winds of nationalist and populist threat all of Europe, that average everyday people, when given the choice of the privacy of the voting booth, they choose nationalism. Get out! Matthew Heimbach is best known for this moment at a Trump rally. Seen here in the red cap, he admitted pushing a black woman. It's time to start pushing back. You really were pushing back there. Do you not regret that at all? Not at all. So to what extent should America and the world be concerned by this movement? This is a, basically a new term for something that existed before and we should call neo-fascism. And, and this is what it is. Now, how this neo-fascism relates to the populist campaign of Trump, that is the key question. And I, I, and I think it relates a lot. This is a moment of resurgence. They feel that their arguments are reloaded as they were first loaded in the 1930s, uh, I mean with fascism. And, uh, and this, then this is a matter of preoccupation for those of us who are more on the side of democracy, I would say. It's been a big increase in the numbers of hate crime reports in the last month. Are you denying that that's happened? I think that's a response to the crimes we have seen. Do you, do you actually condemn them? Well, of course I condemn any sort of crime. As Matthew Heimbach and others like him continue to grow in prominence, their hugely contentious views are finding some support. Julian Drucker, Five News, Indianapolis. Back here, police have dropped their investigation into an alleged assault on Strictly Come Dancing performer Gorka Marquez. The professional dancer was said to have been beaten up by a gang in Blackpool after a live show last month. Lancashire police say no complaint was made and no one was arrested. Now, I'm sure you remember back in January, these pictures of a young lad and his homemade football shirt bearing the name of his hero, Lionel Messi. He was eventually identified as Mataza Ahmadi from Afghanistan. And when those pictures of what he'd done with a plastic bag reached the man himself, Messi promised one day they could meet. Well, the Barcelona and Argentina star kept that promise. And as Simon Viger reports, the results were... Well, see for yourself. Holding his hero's hand, the little boy on the left here has come an awful long way to meet Barcelona and Argentina star Lionel Messi. The six-year-old Murtaza Amadi is from Afghanistan. Messi is one of the world's richest footballers. How they teamed up and how Murtaza got into the Barcelona team photo is a 21st century fairy tale. At the start of the year, the first the outside world knew of Mataza was this photo on Facebook. His family couldn't afford an Argentina shirt, so they improvised with a plastic bag. Messi 10, written in pen. Soon the camera crews found him, and then, winging its way in the post from Barcelona, some real shirts, really signed by Messi. Mataza doesn't say much, but he knows what he wants. Messi. Naturally, they had to meet, and last night's friendly match in Qatar was the venue. 
Mataza was learning fast from the pros. After placing the ball, he ignored the referee and ran straight back to Messi. But then they really did have to get on with the game. Mataza's insistence on remaining on the field of play had them in stitches. Eventually, the ref took matters into his own hands. It was the beautiful game at its best, and the sort of story you need at the end of this sort of year. Simon Weiger, Five News. Who's the real star in that photo? That's it for now. I'll be back, though, at 6.30, and we'll have a Five News special programme looking back at the incredible talents who we lost this year. Of course, we said goodbye to David Bowie, one of music's most prolific and influential talents. Come with me and you'll be in a world of pure imagination. And the stars of the big and small screens who left us too, like Gene Wilder, who touched millions with his comic versatility. With so many others as well, we'll look back at them all, or as many as we can, in showbiz legends we've lost. A five new special that's coming up at 6.30. Before then, Claire Nazir has the weather next. I'll see you again in an hour's time. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.